Let us pray. Steadfast God, your prophets set the plumb line of your righteousness and your truth in the midst of your people. So we pray this day, O oh God, that you would grant us the courage to judge ourselves against it. Strengthen all that is crooked or warped within us until our hearts and our souls stretch upright, blameless, and holy to meet the glory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We continue our journey through Matthew chapter 13. This summer, I hope you have noticed that we're studying what the kingdom of heaven is like. Um, we've started with the sower who throws all sorts of seed upon the ground. We've heard about the wheat and the weeds. We've heard about how one must leave the weeds with the wheat and let God separate them out. We've heard about the mustard seed. We've heard about the leaven. We've heard about the pearl. We've heard about the buried treasure. We've heard a lot of different things about the kingdom of heaven. Today, however, there is a shift. No longer does Jesus talk about his parables about the kingdom as interesting stories. We move from the five metaphors of a mustard seed, yeast, a buried treasure, a fine pearl, and today we have a drag net, a same net, a net cast into the sea. Bam, 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 one after another. It's hard to comprehend what Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven is like. What in the world is Jesus trying to tell us? It's almost like he doesn't want us to spend much time thinking about it. Trying to decipher what it means, getting bogged down in each one. Rather, maybe we should take them all and just figure it out later. This week is a bit different because this week it has a sense of judgment. And as I was trying not so successfully with the children a moment ago, because I'm not really a fisher person, but this parable seems a bit harsh. A net is dropped into the sea and it catches all fish, big, small, good, bad, etc. The net is pulled ashore and then the angels, or God in this case, decides which fish are good and which are bad, which are kept and which are thrown aside. Anyone notice that there are no criteria as to what is good and what is not? What is evil and what is worth keeping? How is a fish to know? <laughs> What are we supposed to do? It got me thinking this week. As ten of us, Larry Bennett, Tyler Wiggers, Ella Wiggers, Anna Wiggers, Alice Gumlaw, James Krauser, Rocco Cardosi, Evan Whitman, and Quentin Zaring and me went to Mountaintop. Mountaintop is the an outreach ministry in Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee. We were serving some of the most needy people of that region. And one of the speakers shared with us some details about the five county region that makes up the mountaintop service area. It's southernmost Appalachia. For those of you who might know, Warren County, White County, Grundy County, Marion County, Sequatchie County, and Van Buren County of Southeast Tennessee. These five counties are all at risk. What that means is they are, have high levels of poverty, extreme unemployment, 
and very bleak economic outlooks. She went on to say that where you're born, the zip code you live in matters. That apparently your zip code can tell how long you will live. Your zip code will tell about the quality of your life. Your zip code will tell how much you will actually enjoy living life. Again, which got me thinking about fish. Get that connection with fish, zip codes. You'll see, you'll see. <laughs> there are lots of fish in the sea. But clearly, we don't all swim in the same waters. Some waters we swim in are better than others. Just like zip codes. They tell us much about life. And Jesus says a dragnet scoops up all sorts of fish from all sorts of zip codes or all sorts of seas. Again, how do we know if we'll be kept or will be thrown aside? To prove this point, this week, as I was thinking, oh my gosh, I have to write a sermon on Saturday night when I get back. I better be thinking about it all week. So I was. And Larry and Tyler kept saying, you got your sermon yet? Nope. nope. <laughs> Somehow it came together. Um, it mounts up here, divided up into what are called YRGs. We'll explain some other time. But it's basically small work groups. And we are assigned to go to homes. To either build, to paint, to, to do yard work, to help out in any way possible. And my particular assignments were like this. On Monday, we went to Pikeville, Tennessee, to the home of Mr. Tracy. Mr. Tracy and his wife and his 12-year-old son lived in a single-wide trailer. We were tasked to build a roof over his front porch so that he could enjoy his grill. He could grill out on the front porch and not get bothered by the weather, whether it was raining or burned by the sun and it was really hot. It seemed like a simple task. But what we learned over the next couple of days was more about Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry was recovering after trying to end his own life. He felt that he was a burden to his family and that it wasn't worth living. As we learn this information, we soon understand that a roof is more than a roof. That building something for someone else is more than just a helping hand. Listening to his story and his need to tell us about how his life has changed because of his faith was vital. Again, there are lots of fish in the sea. How do we know if we're good or not? Then we traveled to Spencer, Tennessee. Don't blink or you'll miss it. Uh, to the cute home of Teresa. Miss Teresa in her mid-80s. And we were assigned to do yard work for her. Simple task of removing lots of weeds and bushes and things that she just didn't have the time to do anymore. Again, mid-80s and she was keeping up her own yard. She told us a bit about her life. She was just a little bit too busy. You see, as she shared cantaloupe with us, she was telling me about her life. We learned that in addition to cleaning up her yard, she had seven goats in the backyard and two dogs and the cutest puppy you'll ever see. Just ask Anna and Alice. She lived in her home for over 60 years. Her husband died eight years ago, and it had just become too much for her to keep up. Her granddaughter had recently moved in with her, 
but apparently was not really making much progress. He had just graduated high school and probably wasn't going to follow through on going to college. Her daughter was retiring in August and moving back in with her, so she had been a bit busy getting her house ready, and so she'd not gotten around to keeping her yard and her garden this year. When you stop and think about it, not too bad for an 86-year-old woman. Again, lots of fish in the sea. How do we know if we're good enough? Our final project was traveling to Sequatchie County to paint the kitchen and dining room of a woman named Lily. And as we traveled from our camp outside of Spencer, Tennessee, I realized as we were traveling, I know this area. As we went up the back of the mountain, I realized, wow, this is really close to where I grew up. As we pulled into the lot of Lily's property, we noticed she had a double wide trailer. And I did a little quick math in my head and realized I grew up less than five miles away from her. But it might have been a different world. As we pulled into her yard, her double wide trailer, what a difference a zip code makes. What a difference five miles make. What a difference the water we swim in makes. You see, I grew up in a house that didn't have wheels. I grew up in a house built with concrete, wood, and glass. Her house was manufactured elsewhere and driven to her property, and it was showing its age, and it was worn down. But as we entered her home, she greeted us with kindness and a smile and told us how glad she was that we were there. She wheeled her wheelchair to the front porch. We all said hello. I offered a prayer, and she showed us the kitchen, the dining room, and what she wanted us to do while we were there. We got to work. I kept thinking in my head as I went up and down with a paintbrush, oh my gosh, I grew up less than five miles from here, yet a world away. I grew up with options. I grew up with choices. I had a future. Miss Lily was trying to raise her five children, keep her head above water. And one of her sons, as she described, her words, not mine, one of her sons was handicapped. He needed all of my attention. My other children were more on their own. She told me she lived all of her life on this exact piece of property. I'm 80 years old, and my husband died 12 years ago of cancer, and my handicapped boy, in her words, not mine, died five years ago. My two daughters live down the street. My son lives next door. This is my home. My parents lived on the other side, and they sold this property to me, and my husband, when we were married. I've been here ever since. This is home. She seemed very matter-of-fact by it all. Not sad, no regrets, just the facts. She went on to say that she'd been in bad health. I smoked all my life. Again, her words, not mine. Can't quit these damn things. And now I'm on oxygen. I had COVID four times and I've been sick all winter. We couldn't afford the heat. And now my cousin lives with me and she's in bad health. She had surgery two months ago. So you don't know what this paint job will really mean to us. A fresh new kitchen, a new dining room, paint of color will lift our spirits. Again, I kept thinking about zip codes and the waters in which we swim and live and have our being. Her water was clearly different than mine. 
yet we were only five miles apart. How do we determine what is a good fish and what gets thrown aside? What is good enough and what gets thrown away? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like that. A net that gathers all kinds of fish. The net gathers all kinds of fish indiscriminately. Good, bad, big, small, pulls them out of the water and into the light. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven will have all sorts of people, good and bad and big and small, in close proximity. Notice the fish don't sort themselves out. Thank goodness we're not in charge of judging each other. Who's in, who's out. But he calls for faith. He calls for faith that we must wait on God to do God's work. And God is in charge of who's in and who's out. God decides when it's time to pull the net in. You see, it's not that God doesn't know or God doesn't care about the fish. It's more that God's waiting for the right time. And God won't sort it out until it's time to end the fishing expedition. But please hear this. It's not up to the fish, us, to separate themselves. That's God's work. So maybe it should be like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that's thrown into the sea, and it captures all sorts of fish. Good fish, bad fish, big fish, small fish, fish like Tracy, fish like Teresa, fish like Lily, fish like you and me. It's not for us to worry about who's in and who's out. What's up to us is to have faith in the one who will do the fishing. What's important to us is to trust the one who threw the net in in the first place. And to trust that all are welcome and all will be called home. May it be so in your life and in mine, now and forever. Amen.